How many people here have taken a philosophy course? A smattering of us. Yeah. Does spending well, time at Enoch count? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, <laughs> I, but uh, I took a philosophy course when I was about 16 and I didn't even know it. I, I read the book uh, Atlas Shrugged. I read a novel. And uh, I, I got an introduction to objectivism and Ayn Rand's philosophy. And I can't say it really changed my life at 16 because I really didn't have a firm direction. But I know it influenced my life and it influenced building of Rolko. And, uh, you know, when Rocco was just starting, we were a very small group. I, we, uh, we traveled together, we ate together, we worked together. And uh, in, you know, in the early years, we even stayed two to a room when we uh, stayed places. Uh, so having a formal organization or an event like this where you'd communicate philosophies and theories of doing business and how you wanted to do things, you didn't need to do these things. But as we've gotten larger, I, ownership and executive management gets further and further from frontline supervision and people that have direct interaction with our customers. And it's important to keep that communication going about what the philosophy of the company is and ownership is in order to enable you guys to make better more informed decisions that will align with the company's goals and direction. I, I, have, I have walked in here without Mr. Brooks' uh, bio. I, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go get it because I think we need to start with that. I, I can give it. Why don't you do it then? <laughs> so. Do you know? I don't think I know. <laughs> But Dr. Brook is the, uh, is the uh, uh, executive chairman, correct? Well, now I'm just chairman. I You're just As chairman. On Monday, I'm just chairman. Okay. They keep changing their minds. All oh, right. I don't want to keep it. <laughs> Very good. Dr. Sure. Brook, sure. welcome. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, uh, yeah, so let me give you a quick bio. Um, I, like Lauren, read Atlas Shrugged uh, when I was 16 same age, the difference is that I was already committed to a path. I was a committed socialist, I was a committed altruist, I was a committed collectivist, everything that I'm not today. And I fought Atlas Shrugged, so when I read Atlas Shrugged, it was like, this can't be right. And I'd throw it on the wall, and I would yell at Ayn Rand, and I would argue with her. And um, in spite of the fact she never yelled at me back, um, by the end of the book, I was convinced, and, uh, and she did, did change my life. In my case, who knows where I would have landed up, probably with uh, some of the, uh, what is it, Antifa group out there. <laughs> <laughs> if not for Atlas Shrugged. Uh, at the time, I, uh, I was living in Israel. I'm, I was born and raised in Israel. Uh, in, uh, and uh, so I, I read the book at 16, at 18, I went into the Israeli army, as, uh, as all Israelis do. And I'm like, the, the one good thing came out of the Israeli army is I met my wife there, so we've been married a very long time. Um, and uh, got an undergraduate in engineering. Uh, they came to the U.S. So one of the conclusions I came after reading Alice Shrugged, among many conclusions, was I wanted to live in the best place on the planet, and uh, I wasn't going to settle. And Israel was not the best place on the planet, so. Really, from very young, I concluded I wanted to emigrate to the United States, and it was just a matter of finding an excuse to do it. Uh, school is the easiest legal way to get into the U.S., um, and uh, so I came to get a, a master's degree, I got an MBA at the University of Texas, landed up staying and getting a PhD in finance at the University of Texas, and then uh, uh, I was a professor of finance for seven years at Santa Clara University in the Bay Area. Silicon Valley area, uh, and uh, uh, in 2000, I, uh, I was approached to run the Ayn Rand Institute. It's all through this period, I studied her ideas, and uh, got to know the people involved with her philosophy, her ideas, uh, and uh, ran the institute from 2000 until about a year ago. And since then, they bumped me upstairs, now I'm 
chairman of the board. Um, so that's my bio. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Very good. I think you've done it right. <laughs> we got we got a few of my books. We might have them here. I, I think we uh, we've got a few of my books here as well. Um, we might be able to hand out some of them. But I've I've written a few books now, and uh, my latest book just came out uh, two weeks ago, which is uh, the Wealth Creators: A Mall Case for Finance. So going back to my fin finance roots. Why finance is a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, but we're not here to talk about me, uh, as, as wonderful of a topic as that might be. Uh, we want to talk about ethics and the role of ethics in, um, in life and in, uh, in, in the workplace. One of the thing, I think one of the great tragedies, um, I don't know, of the last uh, few thousand years maybe, is that we grow up with this notion of ethics as something detached from ourselves. And if something, yeah, we'd like to get to that. Um, you know, it's some ideal. Uh, it's not very practical necessarily. It's not the way in which, you know, we, we, we make money. Like making money is even perceived as often something contradictory to the idea of ethics. Um, and, and that ethics is something somehow yeah, you got to do it because it's kind of the right thing to do, but nobody's enthusiastic about, you know, morality and ethics and following it and being consistent about it and always doing the right thing. It's unusual, it's rare, and usually we perceive it as involving suffering somehow. But what is it, ethics? What's, what's the field supposed to be about? Why do we have morality? Why, why, did, why did those philosophers, you know, thousands of years ago, two, three thousand years ago, come up with this idea at all, of the idea of ethics. What's the purpose of ethics? Why, why have ethics? What's it supposed to do? Defines the culture. Yeah, in a big sense it defines the culture, because I think that the way people behave will ultimately, in aggregate, set us up what the culture is like within a business, and certainly, you know, within a country, or within a particular geographic area. But that's the aggregation. Right. What is it in terms of the individual? Right. What, what, what is that? It's like direction, maybe? Yeah, it's, it's the direction we take. We, we refine that a little bit, because it's not what kind of, in what sense is it direction? It determines what? How you live your life. Yeah, how you, it determines the choices you make. It determines the important choices you make. It doesn't determine everything. Not everything is about ethics. But the important choices you make are determined by ethics. Morality is, is you know, in a sense, the study of what choices are good for us and which choices are bad. That's Ethics is about good and bad. Good is to be something you want to desire, something you want to achieve. Those are values. And the bad is something you want to avoid. But what's the standard for good and for bad? What's traditionally the standard? How do we decide what something good is and what something bad? So, fine rand, the good, fine rand, the good is that which helps your life. The good is that which furthers life, which makes life possible, which makes life successful, which makes life flourish. And the bad is that which hurts life, which you know, destroys life, which threatens life. So in a sense, and, and Ayn Rand here is very similar to some of those Greeks who, who first came up with kind of these ideas. In a sense, ethics is about figuring out what works what leads to success, and what destroys, what's bad for human life. So ethics is the study of how to make each one of our lives the best lives that we can have. What are the things that we can do? What are the values that we pursue? Values are things that we act to gain or keep, things that we want and we're willing to act to get them. So, ethics is the study of what are the values that lead 
to human success that lead to human happiness. So when do you start if you even want to do that? How do you, how do you even how do you figure out what those values are? Right? Or what are the virtues? Or what's the difference between values and virtues? Just because I'm using you're going to use the terms. Values are things you want to act to gain or keep. What is a virtue? What would a virtue be? Right? We throw these terms out in the culture all the time. Right? But what's a virtue? It's supposed to be like a personality trait. Or, uh, it's kind of like a personality trait, but virtue really is an action you take. It's activity you engage in, right? but at, a, at an abstract level. So just to give an example, honesty is a virtue. You, 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 you try to be consistent with reality and not cheat and, you know, and, and deceive. Right? It's a virtue to be honest. But honest is, honesty, in the sense that I mean it, is an activity. It's not, it's not something passive. You have to be engaged to do it. So virtue is the actions necessary to achieve values. Virtues are the actions or the character traits is another way of thinking about it. Because some of these actions sound like character traits that are necessary to achieve values. Right? So, what's the most important value, do you think, for human beings? Generally, just for human beings. Everywhere, no matter where they are, no matter what color skin they have, no matter what geography they live in, no matter what continent they live in, what's, what's the thing that makes all other values possible? You know, from the next building we are in, to the camera, to the clothes we have. How do we get clothes? I have no idea. I mean, anybody know how you get clothes? I mean, it's cold out there. You guys need clothes. Right? In California, we can survive somehow. You guys need this, right? How do you? I mean, where does it come from? It's not matter from heaven, right? At some point, somebody had to do what? Manufacture or make it. Yeah, somebody had to figure out that you could use animal skins because you could dry them out, you could cut them in particular ways, you could actually make clothes. Somebody had to figure that out. And then somebody had to figure out how to manufacture them and turn it into an industry and sell us. So, what is the activity, what is the thing that makes clothes possible? And food possible, and everything we have possible? Production. Production, but what, what, what comes before production? Innovation. Innovation. Yeah, innovation. What outcomes before innovation? Who innovates? A need. Someone needs. Somebody has a need. How do you fulfill the need? What, did, what does it take from you to fulfill somebody's need? Or well, your own need, never mind somebody else's need. What do you have to do? What, what makes us human? What's unique to us that no other animal has? Mental capacity. Yeah, what's another word for mental capacity? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you have to think. You have to figure out how to make clothes. You have to figure out how to drive the pelt. You have to figure out how to cut it up. And, and you have to figure out how to create a manufacturing plant. You have to figure out how to turn the stuff out there into something useful. And you have to figure it out, which means you have to think. What makes human beings special is our ability to reason. It's our faculty of reason, it's our mind. It's our ability to observe reality, integrate it, come up with new ideas, innovate all the words you use, but they all boil down to at the end, you have to have a thinking being. It's all about the use of our reason. And if you think about every aspect of our life, every value that's worth pursuing, we don't get there unless we do what? Unless you think. Unless you use your mind. I mean, if you get into, when we get into trouble, usually it's because what? In life, generally. Usually because what? We didn't think. <laughs> because we didn't think. <laughs> get into trouble with our spouse, it's usually because we didn't think. We get into trouble with our boss, it's usually because we didn't think. It's because we acted based on what? Emotion. Both an emotion, not based on thought. So if Iron Man, if you had to boil all of Iron Man's ethics, into one word, it would be thick. The most important thing you can do in life, for yourself, to make your life better, is to think. That doesn't mean 
you shouldn't be emotional. I'm a pretty emotional guy, right? It means you don't make decisions based on your emotions. It means that at the end of the day, you make decisions based on reason, based on rationality. So for Rand, reason is a cardinal value. Reason is the thing you want. You want to achieve a state of being where you're acting based on reason, based on thinking. In your personal relationships, in your business relationships, in your trade relationships, you know, as a, as a business, as an individual, reason is the primary value. Right? Everything you invented in this planet was invented because somebody thought of it. Every innovation, every new product, every new marketing scheme, every new advertisement, you know, every new sales tactic, it all requires thinking. Every new challenge that a customer, you know, loads you up with, right? The only way to deal with it is to think it through. And to think to cherish more than anything else in life, in your personal life, in your business life, in any kind of environment is, you know, thinking. Thinking rationally, thinking based on, because what does thinking entail? I mean, thinking is a nice word, but what does that entail? What does that entail? Because it's easy to pretend to think, right? What does real thinking entail? Gathering facts. Yeah, facts. It entails facts. It entails actual evidence. It entails understanding of the causal relationship between things, why things are happening. And we all do this intuitively in some sense. When we have, certainly when we have a math problem, an engineering problem, we know how to deal with it. Right? We know where to look for facts. Right? In the rest of life, it's a little bit more complicated to differentiate between facts and emotions and, uh, you know, and, and uh, other people's emotions. And... But at the end of the day, thinking requires facts, requires evidence. It requires logic. Contradictions don't exist. So, in many respects, for, for Ayn Rand's philosophy, to be ethical means to think properly, to think using logic, you know, and to base your decisions in life on that thinking, with the standard being your own success as a human being. What is going to make my life a successful life? What is going to make this company a successful company? That's the good. Everything else is, is the bad. Now, that's pretty abstract to say thinking, right? That's pretty broad. So for her, the number one virtue is rationality. The, the action that you engage in to achieve values is to think, is to think rational. But what does that break down to? So how does that apply, for example, um, to the issue of honesty, which we just talked about? Why is honesty, why would honesty be a virtue? If the most important virtue is to think, how is honesty related to virtue, to thinking? And to living a good life? Why is it good to be honest? Well, maybe it isn't. Back basis. Yeah, so think about it this way. Who is the most important person to be honest to? Start with that. Yourself. Yourself. And what does that mean? that I'm going to be honest with myself. It means I'm going to go based on facts. And that's hard. We all know that's hard, right? I'm just going to look at the facts. And I'm not going to let garbage in, because you know there's that term in computer science, garbage in, garbage, garbage out. out. Well, it works with the mind as well. You feed your mind garbage, you're going to get garbage. So if you care about the conclusions you come to, then you want to make sure that the inputs the stuff you put into this amazing machine called the human mind is good stuff, it, which means it's correct, which means it's factual, logical. So you don't want garbage in, garbage out. You want good stuff. You want facts. You want evidence. You want to use logic. And therefore, you'll come to good conclusions. So honesty is primarily about being honest to yourself. It's about facing reality. It's about dealing with facts the way they are, not the way you perceive them, perceive them or wish them or want them. Right? And it's so easy. Right? It's so easy. 
You know, in, in Ayn Rand's philosophy, the number one sin, like the cardinal sin in the philosophy, is what you call evasion. And evasion is the facts over there that I don't want to look because it's going to make me uncomfortable. You know? So there's a there's a problem on the line. I you know I don't know enough about your business to use your examples, but there's a problem on the manufacturing one, right? And I kind of got a hint. I got a hint of it. But you know what? If 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 I have to, if I if I actually accept that there's a problem. Oh my God! You gotta stop, and you gotta figure it out, and you gotta tell your boss. And you, it's much, you know, it's four o'clock. It's almost time to go home. You know, it's just easier not to think about. It. It's just easier not to think about. It. So I'm just I, because if I think about it, I'm, I'm honest enough, right? That if it actually gets into my consciousness, then I'm gonna have to do something about it. So there's that point in life, and you you can see it in, you know, in, in personal relationships, you know. Is my spouse lying to me or not? You know, does that really make sense? Well, I'm not going to think about it, right? Because as soon as it comes to your consciousness, you have to deal with it, and you don't want to have to deal with it. So you just don't think about it. You don't allow that fact to enter your consciousness. That's the beginning of every really, really bad thing in life. Bad stuff happens when you do that. Because when you face stuff, even bad stuff, you you can handle it. Right? You can solve it. You can find a solution. You can ask for help. You can, you know, there are ways in which to, but when you ignore something, and it festers, nothing good happens. Because it, the fact is not going away because you ignored it. Right? You don't control reality in that way. So the fact is still going to be there. So, honesty is there Primarily, we'll get to being honest with other people in a second. Primarily to make your life better by facing reality, facing the facts, and dealing with them even when it's not emotionally convenient right now to do. Because that because we all know this. When we let when we ignore stuff, it only gets worse. And bad stuff happens. Bad stuff to us, to the company, to you know, whatever the unit you're looking at. So this isn't like a sense of duty, oh, I have to do it. It's no, I want to do it. Why do I want to do it? Because I want to live a good life. I want to do it because I want the company to be successful. Yeah, it's inconvenient, but I want to do it because the long-term goal here, right now, will be achieved by me doing this. And ethics generally should be about achievement, should be about success. Right now, right here on this earth, in this lifetime. It's not about duty. It's about achievement and success and a good life. What about lying to other people? Why, 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 why be honest with other people? Well, you don't have to kind of remember what the hell they said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, speaking, I'm speaking to an older group. See, I use that example. I speak to students a lot, right? And I use that example all the time. I say, look at my age. I barely remember what I did last week. I mean, literally, I don't. I mean, I had a struggle. Like, where was I last week? So with me, it's often what continent was I on last week? Because I travel so much. And now if I lie about what I did last week, I have to remember two things. That's hard, but it's actually more than two things. Because I have to remember what I did and, and the lie. I have to remember who I told the lie to and who I told the truth to. Why I told these people the lie and why I told these people the truth. It's way too much work. It's like impossible, right? And what always happens, almost always, right? You're gonna get you screwed up. You screwed up, right? Because these people talk to these people, and it, you know, you screwed up. And the older we get, the more we screwed up, right? So we learn, hopefully, right? Lying doesn't work as a strategy for making anything better. Not your relationship with other people. Now your relationship with yourself, not in business. I mean, what happens if you lie to your suppliers or you lie to your customers? You make them mad and they don't want to do business with yeah, you. <laughs> it doesn't take long. You can get away with it maybe once, a little, a little bit, but it never is once, right? There's never such a thing as once. Every lie necessitates another lie. As Bernie Marty Madoff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Bernie Madoff's a great example, right? Yeah. It's not that Bernie Madoff sat down one day 
and said, and that's the thing about rationality, right? Something Bernie Madoff said one day, I said, you know, I want to be really successful. I want to live the best damn life I can live in this, on this one. And I, so I'm going to figure out how to steal money from my friends and family. <laughs> Nobody does that. Criminals don't, that's not how the criminal mile works. Right? Bernie Madoff saw a pile of money. I want it. And he took it. He didn't think. There was no reason, there was no rationality, there was no facts, there was no thinking about, ooh, what are going to be the consequences? How am I going to cover it up? He took it and they said, ooh, I better cover this up. And then they start covering it up. And yeah, he managed to pull it up for years, for years. Partially because, you know, we, we have a screwed up, you know, system where you, we don't actually look for crooks, right? Regula regulators, I don't know about your industry, but in the finance industry, regulators don't spend any time actually looking for crooks. They're much more interested in my filings and that I dot every I and cross every T when I fill out the forms that I'm supposed to fill out than actually catching the bad guys, right? Who also dot every I and cross every T, but they're actually committing fraud, right? But they're not looking for fraud, they're looking for the I's and the cross T's. So in Bernie Madoff's case, just as an example, the, the SEC got reports. This hedge fund guy actually wrote them a whole report on how what he was doing was fraud. And they, he did it year after year for three years, and they ignored it. And how did they catch Bernie Madoff? I can't remember. <laughs> his children, his sons, discovered that he was committing fraud, and they called the police. And uh, the one son committed suicide a year after Bernie Madoff was arrested. And uh, ev you know nobody wants to have anything to do with him. You know he's in jail. And what's I mean, what's interesting about Madoff because I think it's a great example of, of the the how dishonesty hurts you, not just everybody else around you, but it hurts you. Bernie Madoff says today in jail, in spite of his son committing suicide, in spite of everything, that he. He's happier in jail today than he was before he was caught. Because what is, what is the state of mind of somebody like that before they're caught? I mean, think about when you lied and what, what, what goes on in your mind. Well, you know you lied. You know you lied. You, you, know, you feel guilty. You, 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 know, you, know, you, you know they're going to get you, right? Particularly if you lie a lot, right? He had to cover the lies up and over and over again. Who is he lying to? I don't know if you know, but all the money he took was from his friends. Mm -hmm. he, 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 very prominent Jewish, uh, everybody he took the money from was Jewish foundations, you know, his people he would hang out with at country club. It was all the people he interacted with day to day, and you have to look in the eye of people that you're stealing their money from. I mean, that is destroy, soul destroying. You constantly are anxious. You constantly convinced you're going to be caught. Again, not caught by the police. That's the least of your worries. Caught by your family and friends who now know what a scoundrel you are. Lying is unbelievably self-destructive. So we were talking about this in, um, I, I used to do a bunch of seminars on business ethics at, in Hutchinson, not far from here, right? Uh, Hutchinson Technologies, which now I guess sold to TDK, so they're a Japanese company now. And, uh, you know, so I gave this example of, you know, you're, you're, you're working late, and, uh, you, well, you're not working late. You go, you go out, out after, after work, drinking with your buddies, and you call your wife and uh, say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working late. And, then you go home, and I said, how long do you think before she figures this out, right? I mean, because you have to tell your buddies now that they, when they see your wife, that you, you know, it's just, it, it's really complicated. So he raises the hand, and he says, no, no, this is, he says, no, I've got a real story for you, right? <laughs> this happened. And this guy who he was working with, you know, he used to call up, and he used to do this relatively frequently. So the wife one day called up the boss and said, how come you got my husband working late every, you know, all the time? Right. <laughs> that didn't really turn out too well. <laughs> Lying sucks. It just doesn't make any sense. Now telling the truth can be hard, but it's the right strategy. You know, often the right strategy is not comfortable emotionally, 
But it's the right strategy for living a good life. Again, not as a duty, not because you owe anybody anything. You owe yourself to live well, not to live in anxiety, not to get caught and not have, you know, business. Have, have your suppliers walk away from you or your customers cancel their account with you. Right? It's essential for your own survival as a human being and it's essential for their own survival as a business. So ethics, proper ethics and morality should be consistent with success. Ayn Rand said, the moral is the practical and the practical is the moral. Things that really work long term are probably good. Moral. And if you have the right values and virtues, they will work long term. Because that's how you structure them. You're looking for things that work. We've got thousands of years of human experience. It's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. We can figure out, we can look around, and we can see what works and what doesn't work for human beings to be successful. Thinking works. Being honest works. Now, honesty doesn't mean necessarily you have to tell people everything. Right? It doesn't mean you have to volunteer information nobody really cares about. Right? I know people will. You know, how are you? And they give you the whole story of the last 30 <laughs> days. You know, every sickness that every relative has. And that's not what honesty means, right? It means not cheating on reality. It means not deceiving reality. It means, you know, acting based on facts. And when facts are demanded from you, giving those facts. Right? And again, that's true in your business relationships. And I don't know if you have if you have questions or examples, but in your business relationship with customers and, and suppliers, and it's true with your spouse and friends and, and, and boss and everything else. So again, facts, thinking, reality, that's the essential. Now, what about applying this idea of thinking to how you treat other people? What's the, what's the, what's the, I mean, put aside the honesty, but what, what's the appropriate way to treat other people? What's the, the right way to be engaged with other people, the moral way, the productive way to engage with other people? That would be consistent, would be the application of being rational. How do you want other people to treat you? With respect. Yeah, with respect. Does everybody deserve respect? Not everybody, you know. Not everybody deserves respect. I know people don't deserve respect. Bernie Madoff, for example, doesn't deserve respect. So how should we treat other people? Because not everybody deserves respect. Based on what? Based on what? Their performance. Yeah, in a sense, their performance. Right? Their performance in life, their performance at work, we should treat other people how they deserve to be treated. And that can change in different contexts, right? So, at the end, it's how are they contributing, in a sense, to my life? Are they harmful to my life? Is Bernie Madoff good for me? No, stay away from me. I'm gonna treat you badly. But, you know, if somebody, if somebody is actually, if somebody's a good employee, how do you treat them? You treat them well. If somebody's a lousy employee, how do you treat them? Not as well. This is the, this is the idea of justice, right? This is the idea of justice. You get what you deserve. You treat people the way they deserve to be treated. And in the context of work, how do we determine what is dessert? What determines dessert at work? How old you are? How many kids you have? What determines what dessert at work? Your performance. Yeah, your performance. How good you are at the job that you do. How much do you contribute to 
the business. So justice is about rewarding people for their performance. And it's and that, that has two sides, right? Because some people are good performers, some people are bad performers. And that means being willing to recognize it. Remember we talked about facts. Be willing to face the facts. And it's the hardest issue to face facts is when it has to do with people. Right? But it's about observing the facts, identifying the facts, understanding the facts, understanding who's a high performer, who's a low performer, and treating that accordingly. And in a business, that means different compensation. High performers get more than low performers because they contribute less to the venture. But in your personal life, it's the same thing, right? People who you get a lot of joy and have a lot of fun with, you're gonna invest more in that relationship than people who, you know, just make you feel bad. It's no fun being around them. And it's the same thing in life, right? You wanna seek out the things that make your life better, really better, not just superficially, but really better. And you wanna avoid the things that don't. You want to pursue a good life. You want to find good people who are honest, but who are going to, you know, make life be good. And you want to avoid people who, who are dishonest, who are bad people, who it's, it's not good to be around. But in employment, and this is always tricky in businesses, right? Employment, it's so important to figure out who the good employees are and who the not so good employees are, and who, who you want to reward and who you're not going to reward and have scales. And that's what ethics means in business. It doesn't mean treating everybody the same. That's unethical. In my view, it's immoral to treat everybody the same because not everybody is the same. So it's an ignoring fact. It's ignoring the reality. It's ignoring performance, which is the essential thing that you're trying to reward in a business environment. Right? I mean, even our kids, we don't treat the same. Some of them behave well, some of them don't behave well. You treat them based on that. That's justice, and if we don't do that, what are we rewarding? When we don't do that, what are we actually rewarding? Bad behavior, bad, behavior, bad performance. Mediocrity or worse, right? And who's who's going to suffer from that? Pretty much everybody. If it's in a business, the business owner and, and uh, is going to suffer. Uh, but so are the good employees because they're going to say, "Wait a minute, why I'm, I, I produce more? Why am I not getting rewarded for producing more?" Right? And they're going to be the ones who leave and. The, People who benefit at the end are the bad employees, and that's screwy. But we have this in our culture. It's hard to talk about this stuff. It shouldn't be. There's a, there's a strong streak of egalitarianism in Minnesota. Minnesota nice. Minnesota <laughs> nice, yeah. I'm Israeli, we're not nice. <laughs> so we just say it. <laughs> So justice would be another virtue. You want to pursue justice as a, as a moral goal, right? Because justice is good for you. Justice is good for the business. Treating people the way they deserve in every aspect of life. And the way they deserve is at the end of the day, how they impact your life, right? And that sounds, sounds pretty selfish, right? But at the end of the day, it's your life. I mean, wh why do we marry the person we marry? What's love? Is love, is love, you know, we're taught love is a very selfless emotion. Is it? Imagine you go up to your spouse the day before you get married and you say, you say, this is a completely selfless act. I'm marrying you, I have no interest in it. <laughs> There's nothing more self-interested than love, right? 
I marry you because of the way you make me feel. You make me feel great. That's why I marry you. You make me a better person. It's not about you, it's about me. That's the reality. Again, it's uncomfortable because we're not used to talking in those terms. But the fact is that when we love something, we love it because of the way it makes us feel about life, about ourselves, about the world. So morality should be about teaching us principles to live a great life. And if you think, if you're honest, if you're just, these are things that in the end enhance your own life, your personal life, your business life. Take a few others. Um, thinking's great, but thinking in and of itself is not going to help us survive out there in the wilderness in the, in the Minnesota winter. What do you have to actually do to survive? What's the action necessary in order to survive? You can think all you want, but what do you, what do you then have to do with the thinking that you've done? You've got to act on it. You've got to figure it out. You've got to come up with a plan. You've got to come up with a plan, and then you've got to execute that plan. And what do we call that execution of the plan? When it comes to, to, to you know, getting the stuff that we need in order to survive and ultimately in order to thrive and flourish. Well, we need to be productive. We need to be productive. As human beings, we have to go out there and think, figure out how to do things and then do them. You know, every other animal, every other animal in, in nature is either genetically programmed to survive in a particular environment and just knows how to do it, or what happens to them? They die. They die. And when and the environment changes, then animals die. Mm -hmm. What do we do as human beings? Adapt. We adapt the environment to fit us, so we don't change our biology. You know, it gets cold, we light a fire. We build a different type of structure, right? It gets warm, or we migrate into some place that's warm, or the climate changes and it gets warm, what do we do? We invent air conditioning. Right? And if, you know, if, if we get too sunburned, we invent sunscreen. Yeah, we're going to stay in the sun. We love the sun, but, you know. So we don't change our biology, we don't die off because the climate changes or because the geography changes or because something in our environment changed. We go out and change the environment to fit our needs. That's how we survive. We survive as, as a species, as a natural animal out there in the wild. I always find it interesting when people talk about nature and human beings as if we're separate. No, we're part of nature. And nature has programmed us to survive by changing the world around us to fit our needs. So, you know, we need a house, so we chop down trees and we build a house. That's what we do. We want to we wanna build a better house, we level a mountain, you know, and, 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 and make, make uh, bricks or turn it into concrete and build a house, right? That's what we do. We mine for steel. We build computers and windows. We take you know, sand and turn it into glass. I mean, it's stunning. When you really think about what we do as human beings, it's pretty stunning. It's pretty amazing. And that's production. That's being productive. Doing that. Turning glass, turning sand into glass. Kneading milk and creating a dairy industry. There is no dairy industry naturally. There's cows roaming around, you know. And yes, 200, 300 years ago, all we had was you had a couple of cows in the farm, and you milked them, and you got what you got, and you couldn't trade, and you couldn't, they were, they, you know, you, that was all there was. And now there's an industry. I and mean, we can supply milk anywhere, everywhere. I don't have to have cows in my backyard. Right? Cool. <laughs> Very cool. And that, is, that achievement of what we have done as human beings and what we do as human beings is, is mind-boggling when you really go through it and you really think about it. That's production. And that's an incredible virtue. We live in a culture 
that to a large extent looks down on work and looks down on producers and looks down on business. But business and production is the most important activity human beings do. How many people were poor 250 years ago in the world? And I mean poor, I don't mean poor America style, I mean poor Cambodia style, right? Three dollars a day poor. How many people, what percentage of the population 300 years ago of the globe was three dollars a day or poorer in today's dollars? A lot is good, but how? I, 80 percent. Like, like 95 percent. 95 percent. In the world today, how many people live on three dollars a day or less? In the whole world, like eight billion. Like back then, how many people on the planet 300 years ago? Well, less than a billion, maybe half a billion. Today we have about eight, I think. How many of the eight billion? live on three dollars a day or less. Anybody know? Two percent. It's eight. Eight. Just, just 30 years ago, it was close to 30. So it shrunk dramatically over the last 30 years. Guess why? why? Why are so few people that poor today? Production. Because of production. Because of production. Because of innovators and entrepreneurs and businessmen. Not because of any politician, I can guarantee you that. Not because of any philanthropist. It's not charity that makes people wealthy, that brings people out of poverty. It's business. It's hard work. It's production. It's innovation. That's what brought, brings people out of poverty. Everywhere and anywhere. There's no country in the world that had become not poor, never mind rich, because of foreign aid or because of Bill Gates' is charity. Now, I don't have anything against charity, but let's put it in its place. It doesn't do that much. What really helps people is having a job, is being productive. What really helps people is other people having a job and producing stuff so cheaply that even no matter what their wages are, they can afford stuff suddenly. Because, I mean, we have all this stuff that's unbelievably cheap. We are so rich today, everybody in the United States is so rich today, that you wouldn't want to be the richest person in the world 50 years ago as compared to a lower middle class person in the United States today. Somebody in a lower middle class today has a better quality of life than, a, than a, a, one of the richest people in the world 50 years ago. No computers, no iPhones, just think of just that, which is standard. We all have we all have supercomputers in our pocket, right? This is more powerful than the than the computer that sent the man to the moon. We think about it, and everybody has one of these. Right? Our clothing is dramatically cheaper because of China. A lot of stuff is dramatically cheaper because of China. Right? Why? Because they're producing. More people produce in the world, the better off we are in spite of what some people say about trade. Trade is unequivocally fantastic. Makes the world a better place for pretty much everybody. So being put up <coughs> is a massive virtue. And what, what do we, what, what does knowing so one of the things, one of the things that makes it possible for us to uh, to achieve happiness is having a certain sense that you know you you know you belong in this world, that you can take care of yourself in this world. There's a term for that. What's the term for kind of having a sense of yeah, life is good. Yeah, self-esteem. Not the kind of self-esteem that they teach in our schools. I'm not talking about giving everybody ribbons. <laughs> And, and every, you know, and patting everybody in the back, and everybody gets the same grade, and uh, and everybody just feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. Just feel good about yourself. <laughs> Not that kind of self esteem. I'm talking about the self esteem that comes from achievement, accomplishment, accomplishment, from setting goals and getting those goals and achieving those goals. 
It comes from not just achieving those goals, but knowing that you achieved them. Recognizing the fact that you achieved them. Not boasting about it, but be proud of yourself. Yeah, I did that. It's good. I set a high goal and I achieved it. This is cool. That self-esteem, you can't be happy without it. You can't feel that I don't belong here, I, I kind of hate this world, you know, and feel happy. <laughs> you can't do it. Happiness requires that you feel like you belong and that you can achieve and you can be successful here, right now, in this world, and what you're doing. Self-esteem is really, really, really crucial to a happy, successful life. Now, where do we get most of our self-esteem? Where do we achieve? Where do we set the bar high? Where do we... Where, where does that happen, mostly? At work. At work. Yeah. I mean, you can all... I mean, it, it, it's funny to me that, that, that the fact that we spend more time at work than any other activity we'll do in our lives. Right? Certainly up to the age of 65, which arbitrarily has been set as retirement age. But, you know, we spend more time at work than anyone. And we get our self-esteem at work. Because that's where we challenge ourselves, that's where we do most of our thinking, that's where we push ourselves, that's where we, we're engaged. And yet, people don't seem to think that work is that important. But this is what life's about. Right? We can all say family is more important to us, but the fact is you spend more time at work. Now family's important, I'm not denigrating that, but the fact is, the this is where you spend your time. And this is where you achieve. And this is where you push yourself. And this is where you get your self-esteem, to a large extent. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that I believe are so hurtful about the welfare state, and these ideas coming out of uh, Silicon Valley of a basic minimum income, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but basically pay everybody some minimal income, is that you deny people the opportunity to work. And if you deny people the opportunity to work, you deny people the opportunity to set goals and achieve. And if you deny them that, you deny them the ability to have self-esteem, which means you deny them the ability to be happy. So when you give somebody a check and say, yeah, you don't have to work. Here's a check from the government. Don't worry about it. You're killing that person. You're denying them the ability ever to be happy. It's... It's horrible to do that to a human being. So you can be poor. You know, a friend of mine tells a story about his grandfather who was a bricklayer. He was a bricklayer in, in uh, North Carolina. Very poor. You know, barely made enough money, but made enough money to feed his family and put a roof on top of their heads, had a little home, and, and, and raise his kids the way he wanted to raise the kids. And every day he could come home and have that sense of pride that he was taking care of his family. He was feeding them, he was clothing them, they were being taken care of, they were getting an education. And in spite of being poor, that person could be happy. That person had a sense of belonging, that person had a sense of pride, that he was able to take care of the people he loved in this world. And take that same person and give him a welfare check. So yeah, quick claim, that's how much work. You know, you need to have him, you know, here's a check instead. That's it. The pride is gone. Now, other people are taking care of his kids. Okay? Other people are working to take care of his kids. His money has to come from somebody's work. So, productiveness, which is, I think, a crucial virtue. Productiveness is what leads to self-esteem, but it's also what gives us a sense of purpose in life. Again, we spend most of our time at work. We challenge ourselves to work. And this is why it's so valuable not to just view work as work, but to view work as a career, and to have goals, and to challenge yourself, and to push yourself, and to be ambitious. Because that's what purpose looks like. It's about having a long-term focus, a long-term perspective. So 
Productiveness means taking your job, your work seriously. It means having a career and viewing it as such. And the benefit of that is self-esteem and happiness and that sense that I can be successful. I can achieve that. And that sense of purpose, this is where I'm heading. I think too many people have the notion that I can't wait until I retire. And it turns out that people who retire young, what happens to them? They tend to die young. It's kind of funny. Right? Because without purpose in life, you know, it, it, life just withers away. And so people who retire young and who survive and who do well and who thrive or people who pick up a, a second career or pick up a really important hobby to them or get involved in something that really is intense, that it is the equivalent of a career. People just sit around, they're either very unhappy and some of them just die off. But it's, it's an interesting statistic to, to look at, you know, death post retirement. And the more engaged you are with the world around you, the longer you live. So there's even a biological side to this. So having a career, being productive, having productiveness as a virtue in anything you do in life, even if it's post-retirement or even if it's about raising your kids or whatever it happens to be, take that seriously. Take it as a career. Take it as something to apply your mind to, to challenge yourself and to push yourself. All right, let me, let, me, uh, let me do one more kind of virtue and then kind of wrap it up. The, the last one I want to just talk about is, is pride. Um, I think pride is important. I think having pride in your life, having pride in your work, having pride in what you do is part of how you ultimately get that self-esteem. Because if you just achieve stuff, but you don't pay attention to it. Oh, you know, you know the kind of humility is, I, I didn't really do anything. It's one thing to say to other people, but if you say it to yourself, I didn't build that, to quote Obama. Um, it, you know, that, that wasn't, you know, I, it, it, that wasn't really an achievement. That wasn't anything. You're never really going to recognize yourself. But pride is the idea, Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, called pride the queen of the virtues. Because pride was the idea of taking your life seriously. It was the idea that I'm going to be moral because I want to live a good life. I'm going to be moral because I want to be successful in living. I'm, I'm going to run a company that's moral because I want to have run a successful company. And it's, it's taking that seriously, not just saying it, not just pretending, not just, what do they call it now, virtue signaling, but actually living it and recognizing that you live it. Pride is often defined as, as, as striving towards moral perfection. Trying to be the best human being you can be. Right? So it's not the typical perception of the boastful, you know, uh, uh, you know, not very nice person who, uh, who continuously pats himself on the back in front of everybody else to impress people. But it's about taking your own life, your own values, your own virtues, seriously, and pursuing them. So, if you're committed to being honest, be honest. Right? Another word for that is integrity. Right? Having integrity. Really living it. So, just to wrap up. Um, ethics, morality, is a tool for living. It's indeed, I think, a tool that's necessary for living. You can't be successful at life without it. Most of us, absorb it from us around. We get it from our parents, we get it from our preachers, our priests, so maybe we took a philosophy class and our philosopher said something about ethics. But almost nobody, look, maybe an exaggerating, very few people actually sit down and think about it. What kind of person do I want to be? What is right and what is wrong? What are values and what are vices? Not what other people have told me what are vices and virtues. Not what's written in some book somewhere, but what do I really think is good and evil, good and bad? What kind of life do I really want to live? What kind of person do I really want to become? And we, we absorb stuff from the environment. Yeah, some of it's good. I'm sure my parents told us a lot of good things. Some of the stuff my mother said 
turned out to be true. But some of it wasn't. You know, as nice as my mother was, some of the stuff was garbage. But how do I figure that out? Without thinking about it, you're not going to. Some of what our philosophy professors tell us in class is good, and some of it's garbage. But who's the only person to decide? It's you. It's up to you to decide what's good and what's not. For you, they're based on facts, right? We, we talked about facts before, based on facts. What is good? So, you know, I encourage you to think about it. Thanks. Thank you, questions? Yeah, we've got uh, some time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, uh, you know, does anybody have any? Right away? Yeah. Steve, do you believe in the golden rule? Well, I mean, you know, there are two golden rules. I actually like one more than the other. Do you treat others like you like to be treated, or how they deserve to be treated? <laughs> no, I actually don't believe in that. Okay. Because, I mean, what does that mean? How, how do I like to be treated? I mean, that's such a vague generalization, right? How do I like to be treated when and where and, and, and under what circumstances? By whom, right? It, it doesn't really give you much guidance. But that's, by the way, that, it's interesting because that's the Christian golden rule. There's a Jewish golden rule, which I actually like better. But it's still too vague in my view. Don't treat other people the way you don't want to be treated. So it's a negative, right? So right, you don't want people to steal from you, don't steal. Right? So it's I, I, I like that one better. But but I don't because I, I don't think it actually gives you guidance. I don't think it actually tells you what to do. It's old fashioned. I mean, but it's also well, it's not an issue at old fashioned because because Aristotle I don't think would buy into it. He was lived two thousand years ago. So, um, so treat people the way you would like to be treated. Does that mean I should treat Bernie Madoff the way I want to be treated? No, I want Bernie Madoff to be in jail, and I don't want to go to jail. Now, you could say, you could reinterpret it and say, if I'm a liar, cheat, criminal, then I should want to go to jail. But nobody thinks that way, right? So I believe you should treat people the way they deserve to be treated. And sometimes that's the way I want to be treated, and sometimes it's the opposite of the way I want to be treated, because I don't want to go to jail. So along those same lines, though, are we not saying that we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't lead by example? I think you should lead by example, but... So, so in other words, if, I, if uh, some dude's walking down the street and he thinks he's entitled to everything, I should, you know, I want to, sh I want to treat him poorly? Absolutely the worst in the world because he doesn't have any desire to go get a job and get the training, la da da, all that kind of stuff. You know? I should just ignore him and let nature take his course. Well, or, I, or, or do we do we say, come on in, let me help you, and I will then show you how to to be a to get into this this whole uh, achieve and succeed by by your by your successes. You I mean, I, I would say it depends. Right? So some people, yeah, you, you should try to help them because they're worthy of help because in spite of him being a jerk, there's a good side to him and he could learn. But if I took somebody in like that and I said, here are the things, and he said, eh, then I would say, hey, there's the door, out you go. So there's a limit. So how much you help is going to depend on how successful you think you can be with a particular term, person. How much time do you have? How much energy do you have? Are your kids needing your attention right now? What's more important to you? It's all contextual, right? But the context, in my view, is my life. Is there a value in me helping this person? And if there is a value in me helping them, because they could become a productive member of our society and therefore I would benefit in some way from them, great. But if there isn't a value in me helping this person because they, they're really hopeless or because I'm busy right now with something really, really important, then I'm not going to help them. So the standard is still my view of the standard still my life. Now, I believe in leading by example, not because, not because I'm that concerned about other people. I believe in leading by example because you should just do the right thing because it's good for you. And if you do the right thing because it's good for you, people will look and they'll say, how come you're happy? <laughs> you know, how come you're so successful? How did you do that? Right? And then they'll want to emulate you. They'll want to learn from you. They'll seek you out rather than you having to seek them out. And that's how you change the world around you. I'm all for changing the world around me. That's why I do this stuff, right? But 
the best way to change the world of reality for most of us is just to live a good life. And then for people to, to look at that as an example, your kids, family members, and so on. But I, you know, we, in my view, we place way too much emphasis in our society in helping other people as, a, as, a, as, a, as the standard of the good, right? I, I, I can't remember if I did this last time. You know, and it's not even that we value helping other people per se. It's that we seem to really value if you suffer helping other people. So, so I'll give you an example. Take Bill Gates, the richest man in the world. How did he become rich? How did he become a billionaire? Secret to becoming a billionaire. There's a, there's a book that talks about all of that, too. Um, it's just a matter of spending time getting, um, what was it, 10,000 hours of... Yeah, well, that's how you become really, really good at something. But how do you become, just, how do you become generally in the marketplace, put aside what they had to do in terms of their skill set, how, how, how do you make that much money? What do you have to do to make that much money? Provide value. Provide a value to how many people? Lots. A lot of people. <laughs> and, and you have to sell something that billions of people want and are willing to pay you more than what it costs you to produce. Right? Are you making their lives better or worse? Better. better. When I see a billionaire, I want to go up and say thank you. Because in one way or another, they have made the lives of hundreds of millions of people better for being a billionaire. And yet, how do we treat billionaires in this culture? Like they, well. Uh, how do we, Bill Gates, morally, from an ethical perspective, how do, what do we think about him when he was just at Microsoft running his thing? Eh, you know, he's a good businessman. But morally, we're not building statues. We're not naming roads after Bill Gates, right? Because he made money, helping people. But he still made money, so it's not, it's tainted. When did Bill Gates become a good guy in our culture? When he stopped producing, stopped, yes, stopped producing, left Microsoft, and started giving his money away. That made him a good guy. Now, we're still not naming streets after him and building sculptures. What would it take to get streets named after Bill Gates? What would he have to do? Die. No, he's going to die. He is going to die, and we're not going to build statues for him. He would have to die in a particular kind of way for us to build the sculptures. What would he, how would he have to die? Helping others. Yeah, he would have to give all his money away, move into a tent, bleed a little bit maybe for us, <laughs> then die. Then, oh, and none of us would want to do that, right? None of us would give all our money away. But we'd say, oh, wow, what a saint. We're gonna, you know, we, we admire and respect pain and suffering and, and destitution. Helping in the name of helping others. But when somebody helps others by making money, now where, where, where's Bill Gates helped more people? At Microsoft or in his charity? Microsoft. Not even close. <clears throat> not even close. At charity will help tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. I, I'm nothing against charity. But at Microsoft, he helped hundreds of millions of people. But he dared to make money doing it. So we, that taints it morally. And I say, why? So we're way too focused on other people generally, instead of focusing on ourselves and thinking about how to, how to be better at living, we're focused on other people. And we're way too focused on helping other people rather than teaching them how to help themselves and how to live a better life for themselves and, and creating the environment and the culture where people can help themselves and not be penalized by it. And the best way to help somebody is to trade with them is to let them produce something and to trade with them. You know, I don't tell my kids to share when they're, you know, they, they're too old now to tell them anything, but in the old days, they trade. You know, Johnny wants your tractor, see what he has to offer. Maybe he has a backhoe back there that he, has to, that he could offer you to play in the sandbox together. Right? Was, yeah. You got the bricklayer and you got the doctor, right? Or you got the welder and you got the sure. engineer. At some point, that bricklayer won't be productive. Because he's, well, I've never seen a 75-year-old bricklayer. Yeah, but so I've seen a 75-year-old doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He made just enough money to provide for his, and we can blame him for that. We could have said, no, shit, you should have went to school. But it might not have been an opportunity. Yeah. Well, we can say everybody has that opportunity, but that's not reality, yeah. right? So at some point, he's going to become unproductive. Yeah. 
So then what is my moral obligation as the doctor who's been assuming all this wealth and, and should I not dole out some to my fellow man or not? I mean, my, I, I don't see why you have a moral obligation to do it. You might choose to do so. Um, but how do you get an obligation that's kind of unchosen? How, how is somebody else's need suddenly necessarily it's like a pack of your wolves, duty? You know? What's that? We're a pack of wolves. We're one being, one creature. And, you know, some people might, some, one guy might be the alpha and you got the omega and, you know, we got to coexist. You know? Yeah, but we're, we are pack, we're, but we're not a pack of wolves. That's the thing about it. The, the bricklayer lives his life, and it, you know, in a, I think in a wealthy society, in a healthy society, saves money for his retirement, and lives off of that. And if he doesn't, then he depends on charity. He depends on your charity as, your, as a doctor mm -hmm. to help him. And, and you have a choice. I mean, but you, but once you start thinking of that as a moral duty, what about the kids in Africa? Do you know that you guys, are, because you're not charitable enough, there are kids every day dying in Africa? And you could be more charitable than you are today. Everybody could be. But you don't. Because the fact is that it's far away, you don't see it, you don't think about it, and you're not worried about it. And you know what? That's okay. I think that's okay. It's not your problem. And at some point you have to say, that's not my problem. Now, if the, if the, if the big lad lives next door, then you care enough and you help him out. And this is why I think charity should be local. You know, why, why does Bill Gates have to do his charity in Africa, by the way? Why do you think he has to do it in Africa? Why, there's enough problems in Seattle. A lot of homeless kids living under the bridges in Seattle, a lot of drug problems in Seattle. Lots of, why does he do it in Africa? So nobody will blame him for being self-interested. He has to go the furthest away he can from where he lives to do his charity. Like, so, yeah, if, 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 if there are people in your neighborhood that, that need help, and they're basically good people, like the bricklayer, he's worked all his life, he's, he's done what, what he needs to do, now he's in trouble, then of course we'll help him. Who wouldn't help him, right? I mean, that's, that's the American thing to do, not because we felt a sense of duty, but because we like people, and we love people, and if they're good people, we're going to help them. But, to take it on as a moral responsibility, I'm going to help bricklayer anywhere in the world and all the time. I mean, that's ridiculous. And then all we do is feel guilty because the fact is we can't help every bricklayer and we don't help the kids in Africa. And therefore we live in constant guilt. And what, what does that do for your life? Nothing. So it's putting it in the right context, doing charity where it makes sense to do charity, makes sense within the context of your life, and not feeling guilty about the fact that you can't help everybody and it's not your moral responsibility to help everybody. Now, you know, some people tell me, yeah, but those bricklayers are going to get up and they're going to storm, storm the mansions. You know, so civil unrest. And the poor will rise up, so inequality is caught, you know, the poor will rise up and they'll... But that's in, in a free country, which we're still relatively too much, but relatively free. It's never happened. Never happened. You, you, get, you get people so frustrated they rise up in unfree countries, like when the king is stealing all the money. But when the doctor's made his money, legitimately, because he went, you know, it costs a lot of money to go to school to get a medical degree, and, and uh, you know, it's a certain skill that not everybody has, and most of us don't want to deal with people with, who are sick all the time. I mean, it takes... He's owed his money. Poor people understand that in a free country. They go, yeah, he made more money than I He produced a product that was more valuable than the, than the product I produced. That's the way it is. The resentment comes when you feel like it's being stolen. And that's why you rise up against a king when you rise up against an aristocracy. Or you rise up even today in America when you feel like, wait a second, Game's rigged. Some of these guys are cronies. Some of these guys, they, you know, some of these guys get bailed out of government by the government or get subsidies from the government. They're taking my tax money. I make nothing. They're taxing me and they're giving it to those rich guys. Then you get right when you feel like it's unjust. But when people, when you, when you have a sense that no, people are earning this, like Bill Gates. I don't resent Bill Gates. You know, 
I love you know, again. I would say thank you to Bill Gates because I think he's made my life better. He's made all of our lives better. But when you see some of these guys, you go, wait a minute. You know, you're the only reason you're rich is because you took my tax money. You couldn't make it anymore. I mean, one of the things that we're taught in our culture is that charity is the essence of virtue. And you measure how virtuous you are by how charitable you are. And my view is being productive in life. Building, creating, making, whatever level you do, taking care of yourself and your family, and living a good life, that's the measure of virtue. And yeah, you can do some charity as well. But charity is not the measure. It's just something, you know, in addition. Your first responsibility is to you. Then if you want to take on other responsibilities, that's fine. But take care of yourself first. And make sure you've, you know, you have one shot at this life. Make sure you've made the most of it. One of the, uh, my father was in, in uh, law enforcement. And uh, I always found it a bit ironic how uh, you see on the shields of various uh, uh, police cars to protect and to serve. And the first thing that he was taught when he became a, a police officer was, what is your first duty as a police officer? You are to go home to your family healthy every night. That is your first duty is to yourself. So it was a bit ironic, yeah. you know, ironic. Yeah. I, they teach them that because that's, otherwise you wouldn't have many policemen. No, and you, you, exactly. You, you can do your job if you're not there to do your job. So you, you have to be alive to be able to do your job. And it's not, you're not joining the police as a suicide mission. You know, the joining the police is, you know, is, is to protect and serve. You have to be alive to do that. Even the military, you don't, you don't go into battle with the intention of dying. You're willing to fight for something, and you might die, but you're not going in there to die. That's not the purpose. But some things are worth fighting for. They're taking a risk for, up to a point. But not everything is. Some was enough. That's why I like volunteer armies, right? Because then you get to choose. Some wars are not worth fighting for. Right? I, I, I like to tell, you know, talking about war. I like to say, if you can't look your son in the eye and say, you should volunteer, go fight for this, because this is important, then don't vote for a war. Don't vote to send other people's kids to go fight for a war. Right? All these politicians who send kids into war, I want to see their kids go before I'm willing to say, okay, this is, this is a good war. And some wars are necessary, I'm not against war, but we seem to be flippant about it. Oh yeah, let's bomb these guys, or let's do that. You, know? you wouldn't be so flippant about it if it was your son. One of the things that, uh, that I found is I became more involved in, in uh, politics and uh, current political events in the last 10 years or so was I noticed that every time that I found us uh, uh, compromising legislatively, we seemed to be moving in the direction that I thought was wrong. And I became uh, concerned about it, did some research on it, and I came to realize it's because we weren't presenting an opposing philosophy to those that I think are taking us in the wrong direction. And that's one of the reasons I've asked uh, Dr. Brooke to speak. Yeah, and this is true in life, not just in politics. When you compromise on something important, I'm not talking about compromise between Italian and, and, and uh, you know, Mexican food, but when you compromise about something important in life, um, on one of these virtues, for example, if you compromise any one of those virtues, you're destroying a part of yourself. You're destroying something. And you know, compromise, moral compromise is unbelievably destructive. 
Uh, and you know, in any compromise between good and evil, only evil wins. This is true politically. I mean, there's never been a treaty, any kind of compromise between a good country and an evil country that's turned out good for the good country. Never happened. It, it, it usually just delays the inevitable, but it doesn't actually uh, work out well. But that's true in life as well. You know, somebody's a lying, and somebody's lying. In uh, you know, your employee is cheating and lying, and you give him a break because you know, who wants to fire anybody? You know? And he one last chance. How often does that backfire? Almost always. Almost always. You know, sticking to your guns and being rigorous about morality in politics as well as in life as well as in business is really, really crucial. And it's hard. It's not easy.